Thanks for coming and watching Exploring Chiropractic. My guest today is Dr. Jerome Fryer, the creator and designer of Dynamic Disc Designs. Dr. Fryer, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm loving the background that you have in your office. What's going on there? Well, there's a little snow. We had some snow last night, uh, about a foot of snow. You're in BC, is... right? British Columbia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Vancouver Island. Oh, yeah, on the so... nice get a whole bunch of this uh, i hear this so, the vortex is coming your way though so you may get a little bit more <laughs> and that's great it's fun we we enjoy it when it's here right um and then this here any idea? well you've given me some hints but okay. definitely some vertebrae of a large animal yeah so these are real vertebrae that are suspended above the i don't know if you can see the treatment table okay yeah yeah right so I had these suspended, kind of go, right? Uh, they were donated to me by fishermen. Oh my When gosh. I worked on the west coast in Tofino and Yuclulet, and uh, I was his his back and and um, and his leg pain, and I asked him. I said, you know, do you know where I can get some whale vertebrae? And I wasn't even sure if I was allowed to have whale vertebrae yeah, or whether yeah, yeah. he was allowed to, like, you know, he's around that. And he said, ah, Jerome, just come by my place. And so I went by his place and he picked him up at the bottom of the ocean about 40 kilometers off of the, uh, off of Tofino, dragnet fishermen. So, you know, they dragged the bottom, right? And they picked, he picked up these bones and he put them in his yard for landscaping. And, um, and I, I was like, a, it was like a kid in an Easter egg hunt. You know, all the, you know, he'd let it go. He put it in his yard for landscaping and all the bushes, okay. and blackberries, and I was crawling around and I was, so anyway, so I, then it was a pro, it was quite the process to get him up here. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. So how, thing, how heavy are each of those about? Well, they were about 80, 85 pounds each. Oh my gosh. But after cleaning them, uh, they're down to about now. Is that just dirt and sediment, or is that actually cleaning off some of the old cartilage and bone? Yeah, I don't know, right? I didn't take it to the lab and have okay. a look, you know, you but I'm sure, I don't there. think it was dirt. Uh, it may be a little bit of dirt in there, but uh, I think it was just biological matter, let's say that. Okay, sure. Any of your <laughs> patients uh, feel uneasy lying on the table underneath those? Oh, sometimes, right? They ask me, they, you know, like, how heavy are those, right? And I'll say, oh, you know, they're 35 pounds each. We, to test them, we just swung on them like monkeys, right? To Did you? Sure. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, they're, they're, it's over, it's an overkill for uh, engineering. Wow, they, they that's support, amazing. Is a three cable, so okay. three cable system can sustain about 850 pounds. Nice, nice. So... We're good, right? That's, I know that was my main concern. Cool. Are they going to be scared, right? You know? Right. You know, but go for it. Yeah, the, the visual is pretty neat when you're looking straight up. Yeah, I love that. All right, well, you're a chiropractor in British Columbia, as well as, as mentioned, the founder of uh, Dynamic Disc Designs, which we're going to talk about quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But before we get into that, let's get some background. And what, uh, when you were a kid, what did you up? I had no idea. No idea, you know, Fireman, that, Cookie Monster, anything like that? You know, that's an evolving question, right? I still don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, I, I totally I'd like get to that. be, right? I'd like yeah. to to influence, but to, you know, it, it, in what vehicle, who knows, right? Right. You know, so I I don't know. I like to, I like to play with, you know, I, I was into mechanics. I really enjoyed okay. mechanics, taking apart my, you know, my Mustang and, and taking it apart and putting it back together, just, uh, you know, learning how everything works. Uh, I was always creative, I tried to be creative. Uh, but, yeah, I, I didn't know. I knew, you know, I wanted to do something positive, you know, something positive on this planet, whether it was for the environment or for health. You know, that's kind of – so, you know, besides that, I had – no, I don't know. I was just – I was just, just, just into Star Wars, you know. So then how did you <laughs> – how did you get into chiropractic? They didn't have any in in the galaxy of Star Wars in that in that universe. No, uh, so you know, traveled through uh, you know UBC, uh, 
sciences and um, I got a degree in biopsychology, Bachelor of Science in Biopsych, which is, and then I was kind of, you know, do I want to do this medicine thing, right? Do I really want to go down that path? My, my grades were good enough. Um, you know, I don't think I would have got into some of the top medical schools, but I think they were good enough. And, uh, but I just, I, it's the influence of pharma in medicine that just, sure. it's just, you know, a little biased. And I was, you know, if I'm providing health services or health care for my, you know, my fellow man or woman, you've got to, you've got to be unbiased, right, as, as best you can. So I just backed off and then I just started to explore other, other channels, other, you know, um, other health professions, you know, naturopathy. Mm-hmm. Podiatry, uh, you know, uh, optometry, and then I was—I didn't know much about chiropractic, to be quite honest. I didn't know much about it at all. And I, and then when I started to investigate a little bit, I thought it was a little bit off around the edges. You know, okay, I was yeah, more of a yeah. science-based kind of guy. I was like, some of the claims. I was like, are we sure? You know, are you? You know, so. What were some of those early claims that made you well, kind of wonder? I mean, was it just this was to the philosophy, the you know, the traditional? Yeah, philosophy, I was. Or? Yeah, I, I was. There was a wonderful chiropractor in Abbotsford that sent me to a conference, and I watched uh, Guy Reekman yeah, okay. at a, at a sure. conference. Heavy and philosophy, yeah. It was, and I thought, wow, this is a pretty exciting. What's everybody excited about? I don't, you know. So I, you know, so I went to be a thought, well, I better be a patient. I didn't have any back pain or neck pain. I was a, a sports guy, so I was physically pretty good shape. Problems. Um, so I remember one of the first things when, you know, they did an assessment, checked my range of motion. I was all proud of it. I'm going, what's well, all range of motion? You're not going to find anything wrong with me, right? And, uh, <laughs> and he went to manipulate my back. Uh, you know, supine adjusting, you know, traditional kind of thoracic adjustment. You could see, and he was putting quite a bit of sort of effort into trying to make my back pop. And he was reasonably successful with some of the verses, but sometimes he, <clears throat> and nothing would happen. And I uh-huh. kind of thought, well, you're probably, your intent was to try to make my back crack, but you weren't successful there, but you were successful in other regions. And I just, I asked him, you know, where's it coming from? You know, where, where's okay. that actual sound coming from? What's the mechanism? And he told me it was a, it was a cavitation. It was a collapsing bubble. So that was kind of was like, hmm. So that was one of the, he asked me a question. Is this the, like, what is chiropractic? Mm-hmm. Where do we get our roots from? And do we understand the basic sciences around what we're doing? Right, right. I don't know that we do still. But we'll talk more about that because because you've done some interesting <laughs> around just that. Um, so that was enough to spark your curiosity to say, okay, this is what I want to do. I mean, it sounds like you were a little bit disappointed in that first treatment. Oh no, I wasn't disappointed at all. Okay. I just need- okay, right? sure, it, sure. It's, it's, what he what he was doing? It was it was successful. There's nothing about you know. It was about. Um, Nothing about being disappointed because I, didn't, I had nothing to be disappointed about. <laughs> <laughs> that low expectations in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just I always wanted to see what it was like to be a chiropractor. Uh huh. You know what is day to day job and it was physical. It was kind of you know yeah. So then I began to explore different chiropractic uh, colleges and I. Um, uh, yeah, you know, University of Western States is about five hours from Vancouver. So I thought, okay, so CMCC, Western States, mm-hmm. let's explore them. Started to do, you know, started to investigate. And uh, and I knew somebody that was actually about halfway through the, um, you know, the curriculum at Western States. So I conversed with him. And, you know, I was, it was like, uh, you know, seven years out of, you be uh yeah from grade 12 right so i was like okay 
I better get going here, right? I got to do something. I can't just already in your mid twenties. Sure, I got to. Yeah, let's go, right? So I I explored and uh, I thought, okay, you know what? This is the I, I felt like it was the most science based chiropractic university evidence based that you know that was close, and right. it's also about two hours away. From I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Let's go. So even compa- at that time, so this was uh, towards the end of the uh, end of the '90s, right? When you went to chiropractic school, yeah. Um, and comparing Western states to CMCC at the time, you felt that Western states was even more scientific, and mm. uh, or were they pretty equal? Because now I would I would actually even say CMCC maybe is a little further. Uh, down that on on that spectrum of evidence based in western states even yeah i you know um i i don't know all i it, it's hard you know you don't know until you get in and get going right yeah, so it's hard to compare yeah and i haven't actually been to cmcc i just know a lot of people that graduated from there um That's interesting cool. i'm just curious to to kind of get an idea of where things were at back then um so western states you know, went through the program. Yeah. Um, good experience in general. Any, oh yeah. Any complaint? <laughs> no, no. Okay. It was it was the faculty that 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 I was thoroughly impressed with. You know. I'm sure yeah. you had a lot of the same professors that I did. Uh, Jim Carollo. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Panzer. Panzer, Panzer. Yeah. Brown. Yeah. I, I preset. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I yeah, preset just... with. With Dr. Panzer, I was lucky okay. enough to get in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that gives me a little insight into, into maybe how uh, discs became kind of. He's definitely very interested in in uh, you know herniations and disc degeneration and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's interesting. So uh, coming out of school, uh, what did the what did the path look like? I mean, what were you excited about? Mind for your the future of your career. Well, I was excited about paying off student loans. That's kind of the first thing, right? <laughs> right? Let's see if I can make this actually work, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest one. <laughs> right? And then to and to get great outcomes right, right out of the okay. gates, right? Try to see if you can get the best possible outcomes you can. And uh, so, yeah, and I got going a small little town in Euclid, uh, a small little town in Euclid, about eight. Mm, yeah, that was it. Small, yeah. Wow. yeah, people kind of thought it was a little crazy going there, it was, but I, the, the, you know, the surf was there too, right? So I, and I was drawn to the to the ocean for. It's just it's always kind of calmed me, right? It's oh, always yeah. been my place of relaxation and and uh, inspiration as well. Uh, yeah, so I got in, I got going, and uh, soon I. Uh, quickly developed a satellite clinic in Tofino and uh yeah it was it was exciting both communities just embraced us um my wife and um and our family yeah and then about uh seven years after in we had children and time to get them to uh, a place where there were more resources for them right uh yeah my 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 theme going into Euclid was I wanted to grow green kids, <laughs> but I realized you know they need uh, they need stuff just like what's <laughs> behind you, right? Oh, like, I, I, this is embarrassing. No, uh, for those not. watching the movie, I mean, so I'm in South Dakota now, and it's um, I know probably about as cold today. It's it was minus four. So yeah, it's tough to get the little kids out. So we've got this bouncy house in the basement here, just to keep them entertained now and then. Um, not my not my decision, but it's been been handy. <laughs> so then, Nanaimo, which is on the inside of Vancouver Island, Tofino's on the outside, wild open Pacific, and you come to the inside. And um, I started practice, and uh, you know, I thought, all right, you know, I'm going to build a practice just as include it. And I just started solo. Like, you know, I encourage, okay. you know, young young practitioners that are uh, trained well, believe in themselves, and just do it. And just get in and get going. Um, um, that, that's how I did it. 
So when you went and, to this little town of Euclid, there were no other chiropractors there? No. So you were no. the first one, opened up your yeah. own practice and just took it yeah. off. Wow. <laughs> they, would, <laughs> they, would, they would say, Dr. Fry, you're like the best chiropractor. And I'd say, Who how many other chiropractors have you been to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. They had no comparables. <laughs> So it was it was neat. So anyway, so when we came to the inside, I started practicing in Nanaimo. You know, I could do this, but there were other chiropractors here, and hmm. I sat and I had some pretty lonely days, mm -hmm. right? You know, well, look at this today. We've got two patients on the books, right? Yeah. You know. Uh, oh, they're, oh, good. One called in. Good. Okay. Do I go home at lunch? No, I better stay here. You know, all that sort of stuff. But with all that free time, I had, I, I began developing, you know, I had to do something. But Don, the, the spine modeling company. Ah, interesting. Okay. So it was just, uh, um, some extra energy you had not being able to <laughs> put it into patients. And you, so what did you start doing? Tinkering with, what what was the first material to, to create these disc designs? These disc well, models? there's so at the same time there um, because I had extra time, I thought, well, you know, I've got a sort of a research sort of foundation from uh, Western States, UBC. So at the same time, I was starting to move with some ideas, clinical ideas that I could move into research as well. So at the same time, um, I'll just go back just a little bit, but. At Western States, get into the modeling thing later. But um, the when I was in Panzer's class, I had come up with this idea of just simply. He was talking about the you know this you know the delicate sustained compression mm -hmm. on intervertebral discs and creep and hysteresis and annular, you know, disruption at the Sharpies fibers and that sort of thing, you know, I'm just, I'm looking at a sea of students, we're all sitting, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, oh my God, right? So I thought, well, why don't we just, you know, press our hands down mm -hmm. on the seat and offload our spine periodically. It's so a little bit of decompression. Yeah. Right. At, at different doses, and I didn't know what dose, how hard, or for how long, or anything like that. <clears throat> So when I, I uh, so uh, you know, in, in my excitement, you know, I go up in front of the class and say, like, "Pastor, I think I figured something out." <laughs> and he's like, "Well, you might have something, you know, but you know, a little pat on the head, you know, yeah. it's like <laughs> it, it, it's uh, so it was a hypothesis that I wanted to always sort of push and to study. So when I was in Euclid, I put this into action with people prescribed it for people that had pain while sitting hmm. and the outcomes very early indicated there was something going on there and so when I went came to you uh, to Nanaimo then when I had all that extra time I was started to initiate this okay I want to measure this you know I want to measure this I want to see if there's anything that we can do to actually get some data on this so we so I can show and showcase what is going on, right? So, so yeah. So at the same time, you know, I knew that the discs were dynamic, right? Uh, the models that we had were that I had that I bought were static. I'm trying to mm -hmm. communicate these things with static models. I couldn't show time time changes over, you know, I, uh, load changes over time. So then, yeah, I just started to play. I first just cut out a chunk of foam and stuck it in some water, and okay, in two vertebrae, and it would just, you know, it would just leak, and <laughs> and and I thought, and I I was doing that in the very beginning with with people, right? I had a little tray, and I would sure dunk it in water, and then put it, you know, in between, and I right, and then I'd soak it back up, and you know, and, and you go to sleep, and then the height comes up a little bit. And, so that's, and then, so I thought, you know, I didn't know, I, you know, this is looking pretty hokey, right? <laughs> it's better than, I, I would use the, I don't know if you have them up in Canada, but we have these uh, little peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, frozen peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that are 
pressed around the outside. So there's no crust. They're just squeezed almost like a pie crust. And they fairly well because you can just tear that outer, you know, the outer fibers. And then when you squeeze it, the jelly comes out. Um, so that's what I would resort to. But yeah, and then you eat this super sugary. Oh, they're, they're pretty disgusting. Um, yeah, so we, we resort to so many different things to try to demonstrate yeah. this complex anatomy. So there's yeah. definitely a need to have something more correct, something more um, visual. So, yeah. so again, what did, you, what did you start tinkering with to demonstrate that after the sponge and the mess of the water? And... Oh, it got into probably about two years of R&D with different elastomers and different mm -hmm. and stuff like that, comparing tissues. Uh, you know, I, you know, it was around the mad, mad cow, you know, uh, uh, there was a mad cow kind of concern in the media and stuff. This is for pre. That, that was about 2006 mm. or so. Anyways, I'd go to, you know, I'd go to a local butcher shop and I'd say, do you have any like cow spines that I could buy off? And they just look at me like, no, go <laughs> away, you weirdo. <laughs> so I found, I went to a, there was a, a hunter, uh, like a butcher kind of like that, that um, prepares meat for hunters and stuff. And sure, I, yeah. so I went and, and I got, um, cadaveric uh, spine from, from deer and and other animals and then I started to compare right like this material this material this one this one this one this one and and uh, and then yeah and then I just just and then I you know then the chiropractor that I was working with at the time he was like well you know can I can I have one of those you know mm -hmm. and I was like so I wasn't even really, my intent was just to connect with patients. So you, you were know, just building it, these for yourself, being better I, in your own practice. Well, I needed something to build my practice because I was, you know, yeah. I, didn't, <laughs> I wanted to really, you know, I wanted to connect and let people know exactly what is, well, not exactly, but as close as we know, you know, um, so, you know, they know what I'm doing, what my intent is, what the diagnosis, the probable diagnosis is. You know all those things, right? In a, in a format that makes sense to them in a dynamic way. You know, like it hurts when I roll over, for example, or when yeah. I bend over, or you know, or when I cough, or you know, there's all these things in the history that patients are really curious about. You know, where why does that hurt when when I do this? So, so yeah, my intent in the beginning was just to build something and connect with what I knew with the patients. In, in an efficient manner. Yeah, you know, today we've got so many new technologies that it seems like would be pretty helpful. You know, 3D printing uh, thing now. And did you ever, ha have you started playing with that? And would you have liked to have that way back then where you could just scan a vertebrae and then make a copy of it? Oh, yeah, that would have been handy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but there's... Uh, 3D printing is, is um, it, it's, uh, they've done really well in marketing it in the, you know, everyone talks about it. It's kind of neat. Everyone's got a printer and everyone mm -hmm. imagines, oh, can I get something out of that printer over there? The production and, you know, there's, there's limited materials. Uh, you can't do elastomeric materials, you know. there's right. So there's a lot, and, and the resolution is not as good as the, the processes that, that, you know that that I. It's it's not cost effective for. Uh, it's good for prototyping. You right. know, yep. basic prototyping. But but when you want to get into production, it's it's not used. Not good for mass production. So you're are you still uh, by hand? Each yeah, model? and I've just yeah. So yeah, talk through that process. What um, you've got so many different models now, but let's just you know. For simplicity, talk about say the lumbar uh, model um, using now, and how do you go about that process of of crafting it with your hands? That's proprietary. Is it okay? Sure. Yeah. All right. Seek trade secrets you don't want to share. Trade okay. secret. You bet. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um. 
but ha- so you started doing this back around it was around 2006 you kind of said where you're starting to get some vertebra so yeah. and until now i mean w- what what have you added um what are the models that you have now for for people to purchase oh use? there's a multitude of uh <laughs> so i started with model which uh I, I basically my first model that i ever created um and um uh it's it's from a, do you want me do you want me to talk yeah you want yeah me to talk yeah, about you, it? yeah pull one up okay. video here head yeah. to youtube if you're just listening to the podcast we'll put this on my channel um yeah i'd love to well, see these and see how you use them to to educate a patient as well Full disclosure, right? Of course, I'm the you know I'm the owner of this company, so I'm not sell models, although it helps. But I'm uh, it's more for an educational tool. So um, these, so this is an L45 segment, right? So we've got I don't know if you can see here, right? Yeah, yeah I can see that. So pretty well. this, let me go back a little bit. This is one of my this is my first one, and. So L4-5 segment, we got about 12 mils on the front for disc height, 10 on the back. Um, you know, the lordotic angle incorporated into this model because it's got minimal osteophytosis. So this is, so I, the specimens that, that I use it are um, chosen for their, for their anatomical bony detail. Then I build from that. So for example, this, you know, you, you wouldn't find with, with uh, you know, with the sets this healthy, you're not going to see, unlikely going to see disc heights like this. Sure. Right. So there's kind of a compa- even. So, yeah. So in this one, and so this is my professional model that I'm about to launch a new model um, this at the end of this uh, month. So end of actually has a diffuse disc bulge. This one okay. didn't have that. It had more of a, a concavity because I wanted to show load changes. But so the reality is you can see that kind of Yeah, so it goes from in, you know, goes out. But but the reality is in neutral with a disc bulge and to help patients understand more clearly about what a disc bulge is, I've created this. Right, and there's some really unique kind of stuff that's happening now as well, because it's um, I've created a uh, so this one herniates under load. I don't know if you can see the herniation at all there, but this one will actually extrude. There's an extrusion posteriorly. Um, yeah, okay. abutting the descending. So you could talk about shear stress. I've actually incorporated now. Um, uh, Articular cartilage, uh, simulated articular cartilage. So this highland, highland um, uh, polished surface here, and then this incorporated a little bit of um, uh, fibrillation. So like a little bit of a fissure in the uh, in the facet joint. So now we could talk a little bit more about our patients if we're talking about core stability, mm-hmm. stabilization exercises, preventing you know shear translation. So uh, we can talk about facet pain a little bit more, and we can also talk about, you know, the, the possibility of osteoarthritis development, right? And that's what this stenosis model is here. Okay. More of a stenosis. This has got a thickened ligamentum flavum, and if you you can see also, um, it, there's lots of detail. I don't know if I want to bombard everybody with all that. I could talk like hours about these, right? So, but this year I worked with a neuro and um, I, you know, I wanted to know what foraminal encroachment was and how does an osteophyte impact foramen, right? So I worked with a surgeon who does live spine surgeries. He's really a man, uh, era Duke Majin, Duke Spine Institute. He's a big proponent. He's purchased many of these models, but you can see a little osteophyte projecting off okay. the superior mm-hmm. articular process, uh, into the foramen and under extension load you can actually see the oh yeah the, it's right and then with that. that's right in the flexion load the ivf will actually open okay right? yeah so you actually see some these micro movements can make a big 
with regards to pressure or the vasculature around the, the sheath around the nerve root that's exiting, right? So now we can quickly, patients will be more compliant. They'll say, oh, I see why I got to do more flexion, flexion type of exercises. And then they I know that, why they've been forward. They feel they feel a little bit better, or, or they they realize why they're maybe unconsciously leaning into that position as well. Exactly, and that's why you know when you walk a certain period of time, the disc height comes down very subtly. The you know they're an extension, and the mm -hmm. IVF just slowly narrows, and then they got to sit right. So you can right. show these micro movements now, and and patients are like, oh. You know, I totally understand that. Okay, okay, what do we got to do, right? So they're they quickly get their their um, their symptoms and how it relates to them. So now you mentioned the the one model that actually uh, the herniation uh, yes. becoming posterior, and I'm curious. So you've got an undergrad in bio psych, and pain science is this big you know trend right now. A lot of people getting into it, and there's this idea of of kind of a nocebo effect when patients look at their their x-rays or their MRIs and they're like, oh, that looks really bad. That must be the cause of my pain. Do you see this happening with a disc model that shows that bulge? Um, and is there anything that doctors can do to, to, to properly educate that this isn't necessarily a scary thing happening? Yeah, I don't know. I think it really depends on the practitioner. If the practitioner makes things scary, the it will be scary. Center provides words of empowerment and um, you know encouragement, and, you know those sort of things. I, I this whole no nocebo like I don't practice like that, so I I have no idea. You know, like my world is I none of my I, I don't see any of my patients going ooh oh no uh -huh. wow I got chronic back pain. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to me. I'd, I'd like to kind of. Explain like, what does that look like? Like, what is like truly look like when there's an engagement between a practitioner? And I'm sure it's all about, you know, go well, ahead. Again, a, g a great example is is x-rays or I could even, pr I'll pretend, I'll, pr I'll try to do yeah. my best to, to imitate yeah. this. But so you see how here you're on your x-rays how, you know, this is what a perfect spine looks like and how your curve is almost straight. So that's why it's putting pressure on the bones. And that's why you need to come in three times a week to get that curve restored, right? Or you show that disc herniation and see how when you put pressure on it, that bulge comes back and puts pressure on the knee. And that's why you've got pain going down to your foot. That's why you need to come in every week, Mr. Brown, to get adjusted. I mean, it, it's that subtle and that simple, but that type of communication yeah. can really <laughs> some havoc in the patient's mind. Yeah, but that comes back to the practitioner. Now, you can show, you know, the herniation and say, you know what, there's a good chance this is going to regress, you know, right. if you manage this properly, you know, the chances are. But this is like the generator is right now, but you create forecasts like, you know, this is going to change. Tissues adapt, right? And you will get stronger, that sort of thing. So, you know, I was watching you describe, you know, like, you know, you perfect lordosis. And then, you know, you're, and I saw your eyes. You're like, well, yours is great. Right. You know, so you could say, well, yeah, yours has lost its lordosis, but that's a normal part of aging often. So, and it's, it's not directly related to poor outcomes necessarily, um, so, you know, let's not worry about that, but, you know, we can, we can think about it. Maybe, you know, extension exercise may be helpful. So it really, um, you know, I can't control what I'm going to use the models, unfortunately, right? It's like a car. If you, you know, you got to drive responsibly or you can go around and crash into people and hurt other people, right? You know, so I was wondering if I, if I needed to create a, you know, before you get one of these. Have to take an exam <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's just a great contrast I, th I appreciate you sharing how you would use that um because there's there's a, it's so different that positive the positive oh. word you know that compared to more of the you know what you might call a salesman tactic of, of uh, you know it's yeah. it's education versus um convincing
And so I really appreciate how you go about that. Now, some of these models I've seen on your have a cavitation aspect to it. Yes. Do I have one here? Okay, well, this is a lumbopelvic model. That actually, I don't know if you can, but right? So. Yeah. Just barely, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that actually will manipulate, but you could notice it doesn't have a refractory period, so is that correct? <laughs> right. Probably not. But well, I'm glad you brought this up because I wanted <laughs> to come back to some of the research. Um, you mentioned nice segue. The, <laughs> I'm getting good at this. I really am. <laughs> but uh, so, you, so we talked about the chair care, the decompression exercise. So I've got one of your papers here on that, um, where you actually looked using MRI at the changes in the disc. Um, but then you were involved with uh, kind of, to me, what is a bit of a landmark study with Greg Kotchuk about this uh, real-time visualization of a joint cavitation. I mean, I was in my last year of school and on all the news sites. Um, so talk about this. So you've mentioned early on, you know, the first chiropractor you went to who said yeah. it's a cavitation, that joint crack is a cavitation. What what the heck is a cavitation and is that really what's going on? Nice one. <laughs> uh, good question because I had that too. I had that question too and it was early in 1997. 1997, where I kind of, you know, I just came out of uh, UBC, you know, with a decent foundation, you know, being, you know, objective and that sort of thing. So what, what was it, right? So, you know, getting through chiropractic, it was always in the back of my mind, right? So I, I remember early on, I was like, I'd be able to observe this phenomenon in nature somewhere. Like, it, is it that unique to the human body that is exclusively within synovial joints like so I kind of kept remember early on I was just I had my wetsuit and I stuck a a, a glass like um, like you know glasses right in um, in, a, in in the arm of a wetsuit and I was pulling on it in a bathtub and I was so like a drinking to, glass yeah drinking okay. glass yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah drinking glass right so there's a you know a flat surface on the bottom of the drinking glass right so anyways i and so it was really it was curious for me right 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 and so it was a, a study uh when i was in panzer's class broder came out with a pretty good study in 95 um and i thought that was you know he's pretty that sounds pretty good but was still not described right the true mechanism and there was no no um explanation regarding the refractory period you know why are there variations of refractory period you know within individuals and and so just you know, to clarify the refractory crack a joint there's a period of time where you can't crack it again right right there's been no benchtop model there's been no real kind of you know something to actually help us see the physical event so you know i put it on the back burner and then i also uh was trying there was another study um that uh who was it mendel exactly now but anyways they cracked a knuckle and there was two sounds mm -hmm. it looked like there was two sounds they cracked a metacarpal phalangeal joint and so i started working with ubc to see if I can get things rolling with the study. And I even, yeah, I applied for a research grant, got rejected, that sort of thing. And uh, so I put it on the back burner, right? And then in the development of, yeah, one of my models, I was sculpting the synovial fold in the capsule. I was trying to reproduce more realism associated with the facet joint. And I polished the hut, so I get, Cadaveric bone, right? And then I got to create a highland surface or simulated surface. So I, I polished it, this elastomeric material, and I put it up against the elastic, uh, the highland surface, the simulated highland surface, and it, it popped. Huh. And I was like, what was that? So that's funny. A bit of a eureka moment, huh? Well, yeah, there was something, right? I thought, okay. 
could it has, you know, does a degenerative set joint, degenerative surface crack too? Does it actually elicit the same? And, you know, I was in practice and I saw degenerative joints, you know, that I'd try to manipulate and I was unsuccessful. And I thought, eh, is it me? Is it the, the tissue or, you know, so I started, you know, I said, you know what? This is, I think, there's, there's enough here to investigate, right? So I wrote a uh, hypothesis paper on, um, and I submitted it. And at the same time, I contact, and that got rejected. Because I, I, so that, that's okay. It's good. You know, rejections kind of, you know, it toughen you up a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then I uh, contacted Greg Kotchuk, and I said, hey, you know, well, what do you think about doing a, you know, an investigation on this, right? And he knew somebody that was quite versed in, um, with MRI, like cardiac MRI. And, uh, yeah, next thing, next thing we know, I volunteered and away we went. So it was your fingers in the, in the study? Yeah. Oh, I was, okay, I was wondering about that. Yeah, so this is a, a 2015 paper, and you took... Yeah, it's kind of like you were talking about with the wetsuit. You're, you had some contraption around the finger, pulled distraction, and yeah, yeah. <clears throat> took basically you know what you call cine MRI or, or basically an MRI video. Yeah, real time, right. and, and the and, and the uh, the resolution was point three seconds. So this is the one. This because you know when we're doing video on our phones, it's about thirty frames per second. Um, movies are about 24 frames per second. Um, if you're playing video games at 60 or maybe 120 frames per second, because you want to see all that detail. This is so 3.2 frames per second. Is that enough to catch the cavitation, or is that what you were looking for? Because that seems pretty low frame rate if you're trying to actually like see the bubble forming and then popping. The study actually looking for. Well, that's interesting because we, you know, I think there's quite a well, cavitation by definition is formation of a cavity. Okay. Formation of a cavity, simply, right? And related from that, thinking that cavitation is a subsequent collapse. But you need cavitation, you need a formation of a cavity mm-hmm. before it collapses. Right. So Unsworth in 71 believed that it wasn't it was more of a wham and then a wham, this this implosion. Right. So that was which is what what we've been all hanging our hats on regarding cavitation. Subsequent implosion by Unsworth. Right. So you ask, is it enough to capture cavitation? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because we saw a formation. Okay. Is there something behind the scenes that are happening? Like a, there's, a, there's, a sub, there's a formation and then there's a subsequent collapse that we missed? That's what I'm doing now at UBC. Oh, okay. um, I'm doing a follow-up study on that. And uh, I am connected right now with the apparatus. I've been able to create a, 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 a benchtop model that was published in the Journal of Canadian Chiropractic Association in 2017. Uh, so there's, I've moved the, the, um, the model, right, which is what I believed was kind of happening. But after the Kotchuk study, um, we, I, I submersed the model into fluid okay. and I re and I did the event. I pulled, I pulled, basically it's a suction cup within fluid. And that was when something was revealed. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so this is the 2017 paper I'm looking at now. Um, it's interesting, back to the Kotchuk study, was, yeah. um, you, you know, you showed, you, you cracked these 10 knuckles, and on some of them you, you maintained the distractive yeah. force. Yes. And you could see that there, that, right, am yeah. I being correct calling that the cavity that, that you yeah. saw? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, and again, the big kind of the big um, reveal of this study was that the noise happened with the formation of that cavity. 
not by yeah. not popping the bubble. It was. Yeah, when we say pop a bubble, we have to be kind of careful with that because popping a bubble is almost like a bubble goes like this, then it pops, right? Right. So, right, it, the it's about the subsequent collapse that follows the formation that we were challenging. Okay. Right. Right. So, so what I'm trying to, um, I guess, yeah. understand on this one is where you could yeah. still see that void within the yes the it remained that's right it did not disappear it remained it stayed there okay yeah interesting yeah yeah that was really and cool then, i mean this and, and I, big was and this is what kind of got me going on it because when you say to a patient that you're inducing cavitation and if they go home and they google cavitation it's ripping steel off of propellers right and so this kind word that's been used a lot as well which is tribonucleation yes so um so i think what was kind of neat about this study was it was like okay well maybe it's not a subsequent collapse maybe there's not some sort of inherent damage that's occurring to the cartilage that sort of thing it's likely safer than we thought right right the event itself but then we get into the word tribonucleation and um well, tribo from the Latin roots means hub. And it was Hayward in 1947, 1947 that first described this tribonucleation. He had a slope, like a slope, and he, had, and he just rolled the metal ball down a slope. Okay? As this metal ball traveled along this slope, a nucleation, nucleation is basically synonymous to cavitation. Basically, it's the same thing, a formation of a, of a bubble. Okay. Right? Nucleation occurred in behind the bubble as it rolled down. So that was hmm. the foundational work behind tribonucleation. And since then, uh, there's been uh, studies that show that tribal nucleation actually makes noise. Is pretty like there's some work to be done in that department because it's it's, it's as long as it could be. So I I think there's a, something else going on with that event because I don't think we're rubbing things to create noise, mm -hmm. right? I, I think certainly not bone of the way back in eighteen late eighteen yes. hundreds what they thought, right? Correct. Interesting. This is really fascinating stuff. I mean, it's uh, I've kind of wondered about it, but man, it's it's amazing to hear go you know, right in all of these different directions about where is that noise coming from and um, and I, why do some joints do it mm -hmm. and some others don't. And, and why why is there re that refractory period as well? And so the brief, just a brief phrase that I'd like you to clarify is that some joints you will get that clicking over and over. Can you explain yeah. the difference between a joint where you can't get it right after and then a joint where you can? Can I explain it? Mm, I don't know. Not yet. Okay, so one, <laughs> but, but one thought I is that it's, it's not this idea of a cavitation, but that there's, there's tissues that are rubbing on each other. Maybe a, Probably, yeah. And I've heard some doctors, oh, it's a ligament over the yeah. spinous process, or, you know, hip snapping maybe is the, yeah. the psoas tendon. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think those are two different anatomical uh, situations, um, and I think we can use that to help some treatment as well. So I think if there's... If there's refractory, we have to um, at least uh, speculate that it's fluid-based, right? It's going to okay. be a synovial fluid-based structure, I would say. Interestingly, in, in this, this, uh, this paper in uh, the Journal of Canadian Chiropractic Association, what we did with, um, with the model is if you pulled it, right, if you pulled it, it popped, and if you left it kind of recoil that it resets after about 20 minutes but mm -hmm. if you push it if you sustain a pressure on it the refractory period can be reduced significantly 
Huh. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, it, there looks like there's a tension related uh, question, you know, mm-hmm. maybe that's why we're seeing some variations between individuals. Uh, which, you know, it'd be nice to get actually a pressure sensor right in the synovial joint and do these. But um, I think it's I think it relates to, to sort of pressure within the joint and why we're getting these different uh, different um, refractory periods within individ- or um, between individuals. It's really interesting to see where this is a good. It, it doesn't seem to be like it r- should matter that much, but this idea of what is causing that crack, I think, will settle a lot of minds. And I think, as as do a lot of discoveries, open the door to understanding. That's right. Exactly. Because now we can talk about it as a, as a role of stability, right? The synovial fluid plays a role regarding adhesive stability. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there it is. Once we kind of reveal the mechanism, or you know, hope I can reveal the mechanism, we can talk about it um, and understand the physical principles under in a synovial joint that creates optimal health. Right? Maybe a joint that keeps popping, that's just, you know popping too much. You know, now we've got other things that are happening right yeah so just coming to mind i don't i don't know if this is correct but it could there be something with the viscosity of the fluid i mean a, uh, you know a right, thicker exactly. fluid has a stronger surface tension which may yeah. have to do with that so interesting well you're yeah it it it's i always love finding people that just like to dive deep and you're also intriguing in a way because you seem to be you know a tinkerer you love working with your hands you love trying materials um and i think that's something missing in a lot of ways um just not just in the profession but kind of in our day-to-day lives now uh technology's taken that away a bit yeah exactly (laughs) it's that tech snack now um and there's a great ted talk a while back where there's this whole school called the tinkering school um for kids because they wanted to really uh you know build that uh, cultivate ability to come up with different ideas and try new things. Um, yeah. So I love that you're doing that. The product looks great. Um, I look forward to to trying one out. Where can the listeners learn more about dynamic distance? First of all, uh, you can just type it in dynamic and uh, you'll see, you know, we've got a, plethora of different models, different conditions. Um, you know, I think just just watching the videos can be very educational. Um, we've got an Instagram page, uh, you know, Dynamic Disc Designs. Please follow us there. Uh, we've got updates coming. So, um, it, it, yeah, you, you type it in Google. Yes. All right. I'll have links to this as well in the show notes and the below the YouTube video. And if people want to follow you specifically, uh, where would you like to direct them? Me? Hmm. Don't follow me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they can look up your practice uh, page, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, drfryer.ca, right, is my, is my practice. So I practice three days a week. I just dropped in a day, so I'm uh, working three days a week. I just a contract with a medical company building dynamic knees, so that's going to be very oh, exciting. Very cool. Building meniscus and load and that sort of thing is going to be very exciting. But, yes, you can contact me. You can find me through, um, yeah, i got a Facebook page, Dr. Fryer, chiropractor, uh, drfryer.ca. Or if you want to contact me by email, you can drome at drfryer.ca. All right, and I'll have links to all this below, and I'll also link to these papers that we've discussed because I think they are really interesting, especially if people haven't seen um, of the joint cavitation that you did within the MRI. So that's uh, I'll try to embed that as well. Um, you know, again, my target audience is students. I'm curious if you could just leave a couple thoughts of perhaps students who are just about graduating and nervous about starting their own practice. Uh, you you did it in a small town, and then yeah. st- students who may be interested in getting into research. What direction would you give them as well? Uh, so, uh, well, the university that I went to, wonderful training. So believe in yourself, right? Um, 
you know, you, you don't always necessarily need to, you know, get into an arrangement where you're you're learning from. Um, I think you can start on your own. I think a lot of people can, you know, a lot of new chiropractors can start on their own and make it happen. Um, it's the best way to learn. Um, regarding research, uh, yeah, that's a bit more of a challenge. Uh, but it's all about finding the right collaborators um, that are on the same playing field, you know, at least same interests. Um, you know, I, I have to give a shout out to Jeffrey Kwan. He's been absolutely an incredible mentor. Another one, Dr. Francis Smith in, in Scotland, a uh, clinical radiologist, um, Dr. Panzer. You know, it, it's all about you know, connecting with, try to improve your, your network and, um, and don't bug them too much, but <laughs> you, you want to, uh, see if you want to try to plant seeds, plant lots of seeds, right. And you might see something starting to be a sprout, go for it. Right. It's you, always you that focus. balance. You've got to bug them just enough, but not. Yeah, just too. <laughs> make sure there's, you know, that it's going to raise the bar for them too. Okay. Right. Right. It's it's got to be a win. It's. Uh, I remember, you know, I contacted. I, I had another paper published um, in the Journal of Circadian Rhythms, and um, I remember I was excited about this publication. Actually, submitted to the Lancet. It was my first paper ever submitted big researcher you know like you know let's run this study i think i've discovered something and he said well what, what's in it for me and i was like yeah i don't know you know <laughs> so make, make sure that there's something in it for them too it's important um you know it's uh what is that um the uh bobby maybe what's that all all the, the all boats rise with the tide mm -hmm. you know right so yeah, provide value. great advice. Well, Dr. Jerome Fryer, Dynamic Disc Designs, thanks so much for taking the time to join me on Exploring Chiropractic. <laughs> great, uh, great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.